unraveling a sweater to harvest the yarn to re-knit is a really rewarding experience and I think you all liked it very much last time when I went through it. But I also promised I would walk you through the process of making the unraveler, how I came to the idea and how I designed it, so that's what we're going to do today. Though I warn you, it is far from straightforward <laughs> and I nearly gave up a few times. For those of you who have been around for a few years, then you'll know that the reason why I picked the name Engineering Knits is because I am in fact an engineer. However, I'm a chemical engineer and a software engineer, not a mechanical engineer, so I don't know much about building machines, but I have always loved taking things apart and trying to put them back together or trying to make new things for the use cases that I'm interested in, I want to do. And I love machines specifically related to yarn and fiber making and knitting. But to give you a little bit of a picture of where I got the idea from from this unwinder, let me walk you through how I used to unravel sweaters by hand. So first you unpick the seams of your commercially knit sweater until you have nice flat panels. Then I would unwind a little bit at the top of each panel. Now you can also do this by hand and just wind it into a ball from there. That seemed like it would take forever, so I used my ball winder. Since I was going to wind it into a ball anyway, I decided to put it into my ball winder. Unravel from my sweater panel to my ball winder. However, my yarn still had the memory of the stitches it was in. I wanted to be able to wash it. It's not a great idea to wash it in a cake like that. So I would wind it back from my ball onto my Swift and then wash it. When I was thinking through this idea, I wanted an electric ball winder and an electric Swift or an electric skein winder. Do both of these exist? Yes, they do. Do they cost a lot of money? Also, yes, there's quite a few options for electric ball winders, but they, they are pricey, but I felt like I could make one maybe. And then the next portion for me was to make an electric Swift. Looking under electric Swift, I found nothing. Looking under electric skein winder, I found one, which looks beautiful. I love the idea, but it is eye-wateringly expensive in my personal opinion. So I thought, can I make this myself? for less than a combined price of maybe like $800 or $900. <laughs> also, as a little warning, this process has taken months and months because I nearly gave up. Eh, so unfortunately in the intermediate time, I have also lost a little bit of footage. So I'll do my best to kind of fill in the gaps, but it might mean that this video is particularly chatty. If you see my unraveler already, then you'll know that I did not end up making an electric ball winder, but I was highly convinced that this is the right way to go for a long time. I had kind of a few ideas on how I could make my electric ball winder slightly different from the ones that I saw online. As far as I could tell online, they're basically on or off. You, you can either have the ball winder winding yarn or not. But when I was unwinding my sweaters by hand and I was using my ball winder manually, I realized that what I really liked was the ability to control the speed at which I was unwinding. You would sometimes get to a little bit more felted sections of the sweater panels, and I liked going slower in those sections so that I could control the, un the tension on the yarn and hopefully not rip it as I was unwinding it. So I was hoping to get a way where I could do variable speed control on my ball winder, and I was also thinking still at the time that I would be holding the panel that I was unraveling in my hands so that I could better control how the unwinding was going to, which meant that I wanted my hands free from the control of the speed of the machine, AKA I wanted a pedal like a sewing machine. So my mind jumped immediately to, why not use the motor and control device of a sewing machine in order to power this e-winder? But it turns out that they sell conversion kits for non-electric sewing machines to becoming electric sewing machines, and it comes with a sewing machine motor that connects to a variable speed control foot pedal which is exactly what I wanted. But as I was kind of designing this, I thought, well, can't I use the same motor to power my ball winder and the Swift? So I was thinking I could just have one motor that I could switch the operation from the ball winder to the Swift when I needed it. To facilitate that, I also found this gearbox. It has a set of shafts that are connected by gears that are offset by 90 degrees to each other. It's also a 20 to one ratio because you want Swifts to turn slower than ball winders. When I got my engineering degree, a required class for me was drafting. I did also have required classes to do like AutoCAD and all those 3D modeling and drafting courses as well, but we also had to learn how to do it by hand. So I decided to lean into that bit of my education which is over a decade ago now at this point my gosh it's been it's not it's like almost 15 years at this point thought why not kind of bust out those skills not in any great detail but just a little bit to try to 
explain how I was thinking about how to put all these pieces together to create an unwinding machine. Okay, so I finished with my drawings. Here is a top-down view of my design. So we have the sewing machine motor here, which is connected to the 90 degree gearbox. The top of it is connected to the Swift, and the side of it is connected to the ball winder. For a slightly different perspective, here is a side-on view. So again, we have the sewing machine motor. So this is as if you're looking from the side. So the sewing machine motor, which in the back is connected to the gearbox, it's 90 degrees. The one sticking up will be connected to the yarn swift over here, and the one from the side will be connected to the ball winder. So I have, I think, finally all the supplies that I need to do this. Well, I lied. I don't have everything I need. I can't find my hand saw. I don't have any power saws. So I'm going to go back to the home improvement store and pick up a handsaw. I think they say, like, what is it, at least three trips to your local home improvement store to do any kind of project like this? I think this is at least trip number three for me, if not more. <laughs> okay, I'll see you in a second. After finally getting all of my supplies together, it was time to start the assembly of my machine as I had imagined it from the drawing. So the first thing I did is I anchored the sewing machine motor to some wood blocks that I had in the orientation that I would hope would be able to connect it to my little gearbox that I could then hopefully also connect to my e-winder and my swift. What I'm working on here is a disassembled Knit Picks ball winder. When I was doing this, I was trying to connect the gearbox to the uh, ball winder via a belt, and I couldn't see a way to connect the belt and the gear to the handle of the ball winder because all the parts were a bit slippery plastic and it was exactly molded into shape. I don't have any issues using this ball winder manually with the way that it's constructed. It just didn't really work for what I was trying to do. So I disassembled it to replace the main shaft with a metal one. It wasn't pretty <laughs> as you can see, uh, but I did manage to replace the main shaft with a metal one that I could attach a like I don't even know exactly honestly what it's called I'm sorry I don't know the right terms but it's a thing that you put the belt on when you have a belt driven component and then I reassembled the ball winder to try and test it out with a motor to see if even without the gearbox in the middle if the motor would be able to drive my ball winder the belts I had were either way too short or a bit long like this one. So I needed to put my ball winder quite far away to get enough tension on it so that the sewing machine could actually rotate <laughs> the handle of the ball winder. But here is my first test. Okay. Buoyed by that success, I moved on to the Swift because I wanted to, once again, before I put the gearbox in, ensure that the Swift would work directly from the motor first. And this is where I started running into problems. I couldn't find a way to uh, anchor that little gear onto the shaft of the Swift tight enough so that the motor would turn it but also it wouldn't slip on the shaft itself. I had a lot of issues with it slipping and this is one of the points where I just, I wanted to give up on my idea, to be honest. I had a lot of grand plans and grand ideas and well, it, it didn't work. The motor started smoking, things weren't turning anymore. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't right. At this point I had, like come so close a few times and it was pretty dejected about it when suddenly it came to me that I have a drill and the reason why that came to me is this hold on as I was walking back to my craft table I saw my kind of <laughs> jerry-rigged situation here with this sticking out of the side of my ball winder I think that could fit into the end and I can use this instead of a drill bit I use my drill to turn my yarn winder. And yeah, it worked. It is so noisy though. All the plastic parts do not agree well with the force that is being put on it by my drill. I'm not gonna subject my neighbors to that. I can barely subject myself to that, let's put it that way. However, I then realized 
the reason I want to build this whole machine is to make it easier for me to unravel sweaters. And when I unravel sweaters, I actually want to unravel them into skeins. So I prefer to unravel my sweaters into skeins and then wash the skeins to relax the waves. So what I was originally doing with the yarn winder was actually adding a step because I would then have to go from the yarn winder to the swift. I then realized that when I was modifying this swift I was able to take the bottom off this off and does this look familiar to you? Yes I can use it as a drill bit as well and it does work. Now a few caveats to making sure it works well. I mean I guess you could hold it upright but then you have the danger of smacking yourself in the face with it ask me how I know. You could hold it sideways, but you do then, and I, like, you would build muscle <laughs> if you held it that way for long enough to unravel a whole sweater. I want a way to hold this up sideways while I unravel a sweater, and I was looking around my room to see if there was, like, I was thinking maybe I can drill a, drill a hole through the pieces of wood that I have, and I found my bookends. And if I just clamp that onto a side table that I have, I could use that to set up a whole unraveling setup. And like I've done previously, I use a hanger that have the clips on it, usually meant for pants, to clip up the section of sweater that I'm unraveling to hold it in place. And then I can just sit there and use my drill to unravel my sweater. Perfect! Like I am super happy with that. That piece now goes so much faster than when I was doing it by hand. And honestly, this is also a lesson in simplicity. Sometimes when I think through engineering projects, I go very fancy very quickly. Just thinking simpler can really create like that breakthrough and those items that are still very reusable, but just so much easier to create. I was really overthinking it in the beginning. Having the direct drive on the shaft of the Swift and it's sitting horizontally, this was kind of a big breakthrough for me. The only issue with what I have now is I still had to sit there and by hand hold that drill. So I wanted to create something a little bit more hands-free, which is when my brain went back to that electric skein winder that I found when I was first looking up do machines like this exist? And it made me realize that this machine, this electric skein winder, was very, very similar to the concept that I had just come up with, but they just had so many better ideas and ways to go about it. So I decided to try to create my own version of this electric skein winder. I started off with an Amish Swift to get that kind of windmill arms. <laughs> the way an Amish Swift works is it has a crossbar, an X with pegs on it. The pegs are removable. And then that sits horizontally, like flat on top of a horizontal surface and spins in this direction. I wanted, instead of it sitting on top of a surface like this, I wanted to put it up like that, more like the windmill. The only problem that I had when I was thinking about this is that it is very flimsy. I bought the least expensive Amish Swift that I could find online and it's not the most sturdily constructed. So the, my first task was super gluing all the bits together that I could to hopefully give it a little bit more structural integrity. You don't want to glue the fourth peg though, because you do need at least one peg to be removable so you can take your yarn off after you're done. As for the motor, my drill could work and has worked, but I do have other projects I'm working on where I need a hand drill. So you might have noticed and a few of you pointed out that the motor that was driving my unraveler <laughs> for a time was my hand mixer. And that is the state of my unraveler that you saw in the last video. It was not the most stable. Uh, pieces would come flying off and more and more twine had to be used to hold the mixer in place and make sure it was steady. And as time went on, it got louder and louder. It wasn't as bad as the earlier iterations, but it was still definitely a loud machine when it was running. It's been a few weeks since I've worked on my wonderful unraveler that I'm sitting next to here. It has unraveled a few sweaters, but the motor of my, uh, mixer is starting to sound really sad. I'm not going to turn it on because it's also really not secured well. You can see I've literally tied it in place with twine. So in the meantime I have actually bought myself a few supplies and rather than 
Thinking about some grand design from the start, I'm gonna work step by step and see if each bit works. So first we're gonna be starting off with a DC motor and figuring out how to power it correctly and safely. I could have ordered this DC motor rheostat and wire coupling from the beginning, but to be honest, I was intimidated. I looked up motors and I just, there was a lot of information about rewiring your 3d printers or those rc cars that you can build and i was just like you know what i just i need something simple and this seems really intimidating these were really the only thing three things that i needed in order to make a working motor that had variable speed control who knew now i know hopefully now you know too if you didn't already know before and you were yelling at me this whole time that it would just be super simple to use this instead it's also much more cost effective at least in the u.s where i am it's pretty inexpensive to get these pieces. I was pretty ecstatic when I got the motor to work and it was pretty quick to then rebuild my unraveler from working with a hand mixer to working with this DC motor. I had to redo the height a little bit of some of the parts and make sure everything was connected. And then the last thing that I had to tackle was my fourth peg becoming a projectile when I was unraveling sweaters. The tension was too much from unraveling sweaters and it would just come out of its hole at such a speed, I'm glad it wasn't aimed at me. So I decided to replace the removable peg with a removable bolt. I drilled a hole through the arm that it was attached to and I attached a large bolt with a hex nut that makes it easy for me to remove when I'm done unwinding a panel. But as you can see, the motor was not loving the weight imbalance. The bolt that I use is quite heavy and uh, it's on a very long like moment arm. So it was really struggling to get it around and I thought that would not be a great thing for the motor in the long run. So to balance that out, I just replaced the peg on the opposite side of the one I already had to balance that out perfectly. Originally I was like, I have to do all four. And then I was like, wait, no, I just, I need it to be balanced across the whole movement, which means I only need to replace the one peg with a bolt as well. And that ended up working really well. Now, why don't I give you a tour of the Unraveler in its current much quieter and I think much more robust iteration, although probably not its last iteration. We're at my new and improved Unraveler and I wanted to take you through kind of a list of the tools that I used or components and parts and how I connected them just in case you wanted to recreate this and reconstruct this on your own. I also saw on my last video that you all had some wonderful ideas. Trust me, this is not the last version of my Unraveler. It definitely needs some tweaking and there's so many ideas and I love it. So the bit that hasn't changed from my <laughs> hand mixer edition is the Amish Swift out front. I like it quite a bit. The only thing is, uh, as you might have seen before, the pegs pop off really easily. So they are all super glued in. And then in order to have a removable one, I got these long bolts. And the one that's removable has a wing hex nut on the, like a wing nut on the back that I can easily undo with my thumb and a hex nut on the front that I can kind of tighten against. The opposing side had the same thing done. So all I did is I drilled through the center of one of the peg holes that I chose, put the bolt and nut through. And on this top one, we don't have any wing nuts because I don't remove that one. So it's just hex nuts that are tightened in place on both sides. I used the exact same bolt to connect from the swift portion to the motor portion. And I tightened the uh, swift to the front of the bolt using a wing nut. I guess I could have also used a hex nut, but sometimes when I've accidentally improperly set up my <laughs> swift on something, like it gets caught or something like that, or I, this is clear of like this pull that I have here if this will untighten so it's nice to have the wings on there and then I can just finger tighten it back and then that kind of keeps the swift moving on the same axis like at the same time as the bolt is moving so that's how the swift moves together with the bolt it's just anchored to some two by fours here that hasn't changed much at all that I've just sawed into place and then drilled through the bolt is connected to the motor with a coupling now this is a flex coupling and if I were to do it again or if I would to change anything, I would not change the flexible coupling personally just because I don't have a ton of precision when I'm doing this. Maybe if you had some more precision equipment or like better alignment of things, you could use a non-flexible coupling. The flexible couplings are a little bit more expensive, but if there's any kind of wonkiness in the angle at which the Swift is operating versus where the motor is, it gives it that kind of degree of 
freedom so it's not gonna break off. I did use a six millimeter coupling on both ends. I had to kind of file down the bolt for it to fit. There are some non-flexible couplings that I found that are six to 6.3, which might work a little bit better for these bolts. And I also don't necessarily wanna use a bolt in the future. It was just like the quickest way that I could think to anchor the Swift to something. And I already had a pack of them because I needed it for the Swift removable pegs that are actually anchored in place so they don't fly off. But that is then connected to a DC motor. So this DC motor is 100 RPM. Going forward, if I were to redo this, I mean, I'm not going to get rid of this motor because it works, but 100 might be a little too much. So I use a variable speed control right here, and I don't really ever go past the first setting. So I would go down to 50 RPM or maybe even 20. At least for me, this is sold, I think, going pretty far down. I would go between 20 and 50. And that way I'd have a little bit more range of control versus right now I have to do like very minimal adjustments. So 100 is a little bit quick for what I'm trying to do and the size of the Swift that I have. I use the bracket that the company sells to mount the motor on. I like the bracket quite a bit. It was easy to anchor in place. The screws were a bit tiny and it's a little... Um, awkward like I couldn't get to the screws very well around the motor so they're not all completely flat and yeah I lost the screw they're so small <laughs> I one went missing but so far it's it's done okay so I don't think it's too too bad the motor does not come with wiring of any kind so I bought this how do you pronounce Riostat? okay I found this on the web for how do you pronounce Riostat? check it out Riostat. okay I found this Riostat plug this one came with the reason I like this one is because it had the dial directly on the plug right here and I knew that I have a plug on my desk so I would be able to easily reach this control dial. This can directly control the speed of a DC motor. The end of this came with either you could like plug wires into it directly or you could plug it into something. I decided I didn't want all the extra wiring so I just cut it off at the top and I used a pair of stripping pliers, like electrical pliers, to strip off that uh, extra insulation. And I separated the positive and negative, and I connected, there's like a plus and a minus on the back of the motor. I wired it up, and then for my test, the wires were exposed. I really didn't like that. I, I, I have shocked myself in the past doing some fun electrical projects. I didn't want to do that here. So I found some uh, shrink insulation that you can put around wires. I think mine is like marine rated potentially. I just wanted something that would shrink and go around it easily. So I like that a lot. Um, you're supposed to use a heat gun with it. I don't have a heat gun, so I just use a lighter. <laughs> that worked fine. I don't know if you're officially supposed to recommend that, but it, you know, I, I don't have a heat gun, so I just use the lighter. And now when I plug it in and I turn it on, it spins something you might not have seen because while I'm filming, so I want it to look pretty but you might notice that there's this like fine dust over everything and this actually comes off of the sweaters and I notice it as I'm unraveling the sweaters. It's just like a fine coating of dust and fibers everywhere. I wear a mask when I do this. Your lungs are important and you need to protect them. Fine fibers in the air are not great to breathe in. Nose breathing, I guess, could maybe help but I'm a mouth breather. I, I don't know if you could ever tell, I have a deviated septum so when I breathe in through my nose, this side collapses, so that's why I breathe through my mouth. Just protect yourself. When you're doing anything like this or any projects like this, just keep your health and safety in mind. Yeah, that's the basics of this unraveler. So I'm really happy with how it is now. If any of you build one like this or take inspiration of from this to build something similar or different, let me know, I wanna see it. But yeah, I will also list all of the things and links to where I got them in the description down below so you can check that. Like you have to say, read more, and then the list will pop up there. I also noticed I had a few more questions on exactly some of the steps that I maybe glossed over a little bit in my last video about unraveling sweaters. And I will just show you really quickly again how I unravel a sweater with this unraveler, how I spin up the yarns at the end, like how I ply them and make that into a thicker yarn. So let's go do that real quick. Let's begin first with selecting a sweater from the thrift store. So here I am in the thrift store looking through the sweater section, kind of feeling my way through and anything that feels kind of more 
natural fiber to me, I will take a closer look at. I will try to see in the back if I can see what the content is on the tag. Usually it's not on there. It's on the inside left is where I usually find the material so I can check what it's made of. I like to use natural fibers and then I kind of look at the fabric. If it has pilling on the front of the material or on the surface of the material that's slightly felted and will be a little bit harder to unravel and I can check the seams to see if those are chain stitched. These are not chain stitched. If you see these kind of seams, I would not take that sweater because it means that the yarn has been cut. So this is what I mean by a sewn seam rather than a chain stitch seam. Here's another sewn seam. This means that the yarn will be cut at every row. I would also stay away from something like this that has a zipper in it because if you double check on the inside and I did here, the yarn and fabric was cut. So all of this bit of the top of the sweater would be unusable for me personally and I would stay away from grabbing a sweater like this to unravel because I would have to waste all that yarn. Another thing that I wouldn't really pick up or I would just keep in mind if I pick up a sweater with embroidery on it that I would probably also have to cut out as well as this sweater has quite a bit of pilling on the front so it's probably going to be a little bit harder to unwind because it's a little bit more felted. After going through the thrift store, I found this lovely red sweater to unwind. So let's go ahead and put it on our unraveler. I separated the panels and started unraveling a little bit of the yarn at the top. This is another one with two strands. I secured the panel to a pants hanger, clipped that to my window, fed the one of the strands through the yarn feeder and used half hitch knots to secure it to the cross arms of my unraveler and secured the other strand to to my manual ball winder. I then turned on my unraveler at a very slow speed. So this is how I handle a sweater with two strands. So that is turned on at a very slow speed and is running consistently while I use my ball winder, watching what the unraveler is doing to manually ravel up the other string. This is how I do it right now. This is definitely a big point where I think I can improve in the future, but it is still a lot more relaxing than it ever has been in the past. And even Nutella can hang out with me and I can cuddle her while I'm unraveling a sweater, which is definitely unheard of before. So I'm really happy with this setup, although there is definitely room for improvement in the future. Once I have unraveled the entire panel, I take the ball that I wound up on the ball winder off. I attach it to the one that the unraveler was working on, and then I just let the unraveler run so that the whole panel is in one skein. I don't have, you know, double the skeins because I have two yarns at once. So we unraveled the sweater and like I talked about in my last video about unraveling a sweater and using my unwinder, we have now also washed the wool. So I've wound it into a skein, I've washed it in some detergent, I've put it through, I've rinsed that detergent off, I've put it through a vinegar soak solution, sometimes I'll add a, a hint of conditioner if it was a little felted, and now I have wound it back into a ball after it fully dried. This yarn this is a cashmere yarn and it's gorgeous but the the yarn is so thin and of course you can knit with that if you want to knit with like incredibly lace weight yarn maybe you're making a shetland shawl and this is perfect for that or you can also just hold two at a time. For me, actually, I want to put this through my knitting machine. You can also ply it up if you're hand knitting with it. So rather than having maybe some tension issues between the two, because I've, I've done that and I've had those tension issues. But if I'm putting this through the knitting machine, I also want this to be plied up. Now, I had a lot of questions on my last video on how exactly you get the plying done. And just like, I guess, any kind of string, if you attempt to spin it in any direction, choose a direction, and you leave it like that, that's kind of like a singles yarn and it still has a lot of energy in it. However, what I found and what I learned, you run it through your spinning wheel once in a direction, that gives energy to the yarn and then you ply it in the opposite direction. The number one question might be, okay, what direction? And a lot of times the yarns that come that from the sweaters that you unravel, they will have a twist to them already. And the first time that I run this yarn through my spinning wheel, I'm going to run it in that direction. So I'll give it more twist in the direction it's already been spun and or plied. So this one is, hold up, <laughs> I need my glasses. This one is S twist. 
I check the thickness of yarn that I want to make for this, I was thinking that I was going to take two of my separate strands together and ply them together. Or sometimes, you know, you can do the uh, plying within one center pole ball where you ply from the center and the outside at the same time. But I actually want a three stranded twist. So I think I'm going to chain ply. I've never chain plied before in my life. <laughs> so I'm gonna look at Jillian Eve's video, Evie's video on how to chain ply. Some people also call it Navajo plying, but she recommends calling it chain plying and she has a whole video on why, which I think is really interesting. So go ahead and watch if that's something that you're interested in. Let's put our lovely yarn through my spinning wheel on S twist first, and then I'm going to attempt to chain ply it in Z twist. Like I discussed at length, each individual strand from my sweater was passed through my spinning wheel first in the S twist direction until I was completely through with all of the different panels. This takes a bit of time and then it was time to do some chain plying. Um, I struggled <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> It definitely some knots in my chain plying, uh, some tension issues in my chain plying, but after doing quite a few hundred yards of this, I think I got a little bit better hang of it and the yarn ended up turning out perfect for my intended application. I think you can see the difference here in the unplied yarn versus the plied yarn. And like I said, you can just hold multiple strands together if you prefer, but it's nice to have a plied yarn when I'm using my knitting machine. I didn't think that making an unraveling machine for my sweaters would be an easy thing, but given that there were e-ball winders and e-skein winders that existed, I didn't think it get, would give me as much trouble as it did. But I am so glad that I persevered. I guess the next thing is I do, I really want an e-ball winder. It'd be cool if I could make one of those for myself as well. I'm going to be continuing to unravel sweaters with my yarn unwinder or unraveler, but I have a big project coming what I need a lot of yarn for. It's going to involve a lot more machines and a lot more knitting. So if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in, feel free to subscribe. Thank you again so much for watching and I will see you again next time where I'm going to be attempting to set up and use a different kind of knitting machine than I've ever done before. And it's definitely not straightforward either. So there will be some struggles in that one as well if you appreciate that. So I hope that I'll see you next time. Bye. Can you hear her? She's breathing directly into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs>